Okay. So as Jody mentioned, uh, my name is Cassie, and I'm here to talk about my work involving crop growth model calibration and simulation of common hybrids in the Genomes to Fields initiative. So to begin, I want to give a brief overview of what a simulation model is. So a simulation model integrates knowledge from field and laboratory research in the form of mathematical equations and attempts to represent a real world system. In agriculture, this system could include organ, plant, field, a farm, or even a region. Um, a crop growth model is a type of simulation model. In my work, I'm using the um, modeling platform Agricultural Production System Simulator, commonly known as AppSim. And the inputs of a crop growth model include weather, such as temperature, rainfall, radiation, soil parameters, crop parameters, which I'll be focusing on in my presentation today, um, and management. Some of the outputs that we can get from a crop growth model include crop staging, grain yield, biomass yield, um, soil water, nitrogen cycling, among many others. So specifically, I'm using the APSIM maize model version 7.10, which was released in 2018. Um, and there are four important physiological components of this maize model. One is phenology, which is essentially how many um, growing degree days does it take for a crop to grow from stage to stage. The second being biomass production, which is essentially how much carbon is accumulated or simulated or accumulated per simulated day. Um, and the model will calculate biomass production um, under potential water limited and nitrogen limited conditions. Um, next is le leaf development, which is um, directly related to biomass production, and then biomass partitioning. So in the maize model, phenology is divided into 11 stages as depicted here in this figure, um, beginning with planting to harvest. And the duration of each of these stages is calculated as a function of temperature and um, photo period, and also impacted by stresses such as uh, water and nitrogen. In addition, the duration of each of these stages is also um, a cultivar, can also be a cultivar or hybrid specific coefficient. Um, and we'll see examples of phenological parameters that I use in my calibrations. So next is canopy leaf development. Um, the model will uh, simulate leaf area per plant using a predictive or predefined bell curve similar to what is shown here in this figure. Um, and this is based off of 2015 data from the FACTS experiment where we have corn leaf number on the x-axis and leaf area per leaf in centimeter squared on the y-axis. Next, the model um, simulates leaf number per plant um, using temperature and leaf appearance. Um, rates, which can also be made hybrid specific uh, as hybrid specific parameters and thus vary among hybrids. And lastly, leaf area index is a product of leaf area per plant times the number of plants per meter squared. And again, this estimate can be um, uh, limited by water, nitrogen, and carbon availability. So next is biomass production and partitioning. So the model will um, calculate or simulate biomass production or rather daily crop growth rate um, as a minimum of two estimates, one being limited by light, so radiation use efficiency times radiation interception, and the other limited by water, soil water supply times transpiration efficiency, which has been adjusted for vapor pressure deficit. And then the, next, the model will determine where this dry matter is partitioned, and this is typically stage dependent. But it generally find, uh, follows this trend where before, follow, uh, before flowering, Dry matter primarily goes to the leaves, roots, and stems. So we see, again, from real data in 2017, the FACTS um, experiment, where we have corn biomass in grams per meter squared on the x-axis, and the fraction of biomass being allocated to the leaves on the y-axis. And this around here is flowering. So prior to flowering, we're seeing that most of the biomass is being allocated to the leaves. After flowering, the dry matter primarily goes to the grains and then remaining to the roots and stems. And we see this when we plot kernel number per meter squared against crop growth rate. We see that as crop growth rate increases, the kernel number per meter squared increases as well. And additionally, the model calculates grain dry matter um, on a daily basis as a product of kernel number, kernel size, the number of plants per meter squared. And this is also, again, impacted by stresses such as heat and water and nitrogen. So before I get into my calibration and simulation results, I want to give just a brief overview or introduction to the Genomes to Fields initiative for those who are not familiar. Um, 
The Genomes to Fields Initiative is a publicly initiated um, research initiative to catalyze and coordinate research linking genomics and predictive phenomics. So um, a major component of this Genomes to Fields initiative is the Genomes by Environment subproject. Um, since 2014, 180,000 field plots have been evaluated across 162 unique environments that are uh, categorized in these highlighted areas in the map above. Um, and greater, more than 2,500 hybrids have been evaluated. So how it works is a cooperator will grow out approximately 500 field plots of a subset of these hybrids. And these, the subset is determined um, either based on their maturity adaptation or other factors, but there is an attempt to keep some continuity among all of these environments. And so there's a common set of around 20 hybrids that are found in most of these environments. And from that 20 hybrids, uh, from those 20 hybrids, I have 12 hybrids that I'm working with in my project. So uh, next we'll go into the calibration and simulation results. So my objective was to determine which parameters differentiate 12 XPVP hybrids that are a part of genomes to fields and determine if differences in yield, phenology, um, biomass accumulation and partitioning and nitrogen uptake can be accurately simulated using a limited set of parameters. So first, what does a maze hybrid look like in APSIM? So this is a snapshot from APSIM. APSIM um, is written, this is what it would look like if you open the APSIM user interface. Um, but APSIM is written in XML format, so this is just a snapshot of the actual XML code. Um, and APSIM contains around 70 maze hybrids, but these hybrids are primarily generic and based off of relative maturities. But this example that I'm highlighting here is a G2F hybrid that I manually created um, by calibrating the above parameters that are shown in this XML file. Um, so this is uh, hi highlighting some of those parameters um, for and giving the corresponding values for two of the 12 hybrids. So in APSIM, there are, in the maze model, there are approximately 100 maze parameters. 10% of these are kind of deemed by the model to be hybrid specific parameters. So when, um, when starting my calibration process, I first focused on these 10% of um, parameters, which are primarily phenological. For instance, flowering to physiological maturity, this is the thermal time from silking to physiological maturity. And for B73 by MO17, this was 879. And for PHW52 by PHM49, it was 990. We then moved on to um, other parameters that weren't necessarily hybrid specific parameters, but you can make them hybrid, sp hybrid specific parameters by changing the values. Um, so a few of those include leaf appearance rate and the partitioning between leaf and stem, for instance. So the next couple of graphs I'll be showing are observed versus simulated graphs. Um, for one hybrid, just for the sake of time, we're just highlighting one hybrid today. This is B73 by MO17. Um, so I should mention that all the observed values are based off of empirical field data collected from 2017 in field trials. We grew them out in an RCBD for all 12 hybrids with three replications. So all of these um, red dots you see are uh, actual values that we went, when we went and did biomass harvest, those are values that we got. And then these lines are simulated values from the model. So this first panel is above ground biomass plotted across the 2017 season, um, observed, observed versus simulated. And then this is green and senesce leaf biomass. So this is our green biomass, our senesce leaf biomass. Um, here you can see some discrepancies. For instance, our observed values are quite a bit different from our simulated values on this last time point. We believe this has to do with our sampling procedures. As I mentioned, this is just based off of one year of data. So as we um, include more data and improve our sampling procedures, we hope to improve our calibrations. Uh, this is stem biomass in grams per meter squared plotted across the 2017 season and grain biomass in grams per meter squared. And if we want to take a better look at these um, grain components, we can look at grain number, grain size, harvest index, which we seem to be pretty good for just having one year of data, yield in kilograms per hectare. And then also nitrogen uptake, we can look at that. Um, this is above ground biomass nitrogen. Again, these are our observed values and our simulated values. Grain nitrogen, green leaf nitrogen, and stem nitrogen. 
So the next few graphs I'll be showing are an example of the types of output that we can get from AppSim that allow us to better understand distinct physiological differences among these hybrids. So I'm highlighting five of the 12 hybrids here. Um, but as we can see, this hybrid here is PHJ40 by LH82. This was one of the earlier hybrids that we had in my experiment. So you can see that it accumulates its stock biomass much faster, um, much earlier than um, the other four hybrids here. This hybrid is B73 by MO17. We know that B73 is a prominent stiff stock, um, so that might not be a huge surprise that it's accumulating the most stock biomass compared to the other four. Another interesting one is LH195 by 185. Um, it has comparable stock biomass to the other four, but it seems to hold on to this stock biomass much longer than the other four. And then again, looking at these same five, hy five hybrids, but looking at simulated grain nitrogen concentration, we can see, again, that this is our earliest hybrid, PHJ40 by LH82, so it's quite separate from the other four. Um, LH195 by PHZ51 had the highest grain nitrogen concentration. And it's important to note that just a slight change in grain nitrogen concentration can have a large impact in grain nitrogen uptake, and thus a large impact in grain yield. Um, which leads me to my next point, which is that as uh, breeders, we often use grain yield as an uh, end of season component of performance. But there are many drivers of yield. For instance, grain nitrogen concentration or stock biomass can have an impact on standability and thus yield. So as breeders, when we select on grain yield in one year and select on grain yield in another year, there's a high probability that we may not be selecting on that same driving component across both years. Um, and this is where crop growth models can become very useful in allowing us to understand these dis distinct physiological differences among these hybrids. And just to show a couple more graphs, um, this is simulated harvest index and yield for these same five hybrids. Um, an interesting thing to know is, for instance, this is our early hybrid again, PHJ40 by LH82. It has the highest harvest index compared to the other four, including B73 by MO17. But when we look at yield, B73 by MO17 has a higher yield than PHJ40 by LH82. So again, these are the types of things that we can look at with uh, crop growth models. So I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to work on a project like this. Um, coming from a breeding perspective and then working on crop growth models, it allows you to really evaluate um, the challenges and the benefits of uh, integrating crop growth models and plant breeding. Um, so a few of the challenges are, um, for instance, when working with crop growth models and doing modeling work, they typically use very large plots with very few hybrids, whereas breeders, we're more used to using smaller plots but looking at many hybrids. And so this poses a real challenge um, because uh, gathering the, the data and information that we need to get these hybrid specific parameters is very time and labor intensive. So when working with so many hybrids as breeders often do, this is a big challenge. Another challenge or difference between crop growth model modeling and breeding is um, the idea of subjective and objective modeling. Um, so the calibration and parameterization process is a very subjective process. You're essentially fitting the model to the data using some um, limitations and physiological constraints, of course, with the model, but you are fitting the model to the data. Whereas plant breeders, we're typically used to taking a more objective approach um, through statistical estimation and using likelihood estimates, for example. But this is really um, a big challenge um, for crop growth models that they're just too mathematically complex. There's too many nonlinear relationships and too many parameters in general. But as I mentioned, the real benefit to using crop growth models and plant breeding is that crop models allow us to really understand these differences um, and varying components of performance such as yield. So in the future, we plan to continue our calibrations using 2018 and 2019 data and just improve these calibrations, optimize our, optimize our sampling procedures, um, perform statistical evaluation by computing mean square error prediction values for a subset of these hybrid parameters, and then lastly, do validation testing by um, taking these calibrated models and seeing if we can simulate the grain yield data that we observe in these genomes to fields um, environments. And this will essentially allow us to ask the question, which is, can we simulate genotype by environment interactions? So in Bernardo's book, we um, 
read about three generalized methods that breeders typically take to cope with or deal with <laughs> genotype by environment interactions. The first being ignore it. This is where you grow, um, Bernardo describes this as where you grow um, your cultivars across a, a diverse set of environments and then you select your cultivar of choice based upon mean performance across all of these environments. You can reduce it by essentially categorizing um, your environments into more homogeneous subgroups. You can use principal component or cluster analysis to um, group your environments and then you can select cultivars based upon how they perform in these subgroups of environments. You can exploit it. This is where a breeder would take an approach to find um, a specific hybrid that performs best in a specific environment. Um, you can use stability analysis uh, or multiplicative models to help, help with that. Um, example being Aquamax, which um, is a pioneer hybrid that's meant to perform well in water limited conditions. Um, but then I would also propose that there's a fourth which is that we predict it. And crop growth models, um, up, until now, up until now, methods to predict G by E have pri primarily been statistical in nature, um, but crop growth models allow us a real biological um, approach to modeling G by E based upon actual biological knowledge. Um, and this will also allow us to help um, predict in unobserved environments, which can be very useful. And so with that, I would just like to thank um, my major professor, Jody Edwards, um, Soterios, who's been a great help in crop growth models, and AFSIM, and undergraduate employees without whom I'd still be drowning in biomass harvest, um, and all my funding agencies. And with that, I'd take any questions. Uh, you said that you chose 12 hybrids out of uh, the core set of 20. How did you choose those 12? Um, so the 12 that we chose are primarily picked because they make up a factorial design. Um, so if you were to actually look at them, they have common males and females, and we're hoping to eventually look at combining ability. Um, so that, that's the main purpose. G. Um, so her question is that my, my models and my calibrations and simulations are based off of these 12 hybrids, but can we extrapolate to different hybrids and perform? Um, so I would say that um, when calibrating the crop growth model, we're specifically looking for parameters that are hybrid specific. So you need to calibrate the model for every hybrid. But we are hopefully, like I mentioned, looking at combining ability and potentially looking at maybe if you can um, look at inbreds, and then you could predict how your inbreds, if you had one inbred and another inbred, how they would predict as a hybrid. Um, that may allow you to look at different combinations of hybrids, um, but right now I would say they're based off of the, spe the 12 specific hybrids I'm looking at. Um, so the parameters that I, I mentioned that there's around 100 parameters in AFSIM that are in the AFSIM maze model. 10% of these are pretty much hybrid specific. Most of these are phenological, so emergence to end of juvenile. All of these are hybrid specific parameters. Um, so I focused on those and then I brought in other ones that I made hybrid specific, such as leaf appearance rate. Um, does that answer your question? Sorry. Oh, how did I come up with the numbers? Yeah. Oh, it's based off of empirical field data that we collected in 2017. So we measured these and... Um, but th these are all linear relationships, so it's just uh, like positive. Yes, more or less, yeah. Jeff? 
chunk. Did you have to take measurements for each individual location that these are grown at for soil texture and all of this, or are you just going with some average, average environment? So all of the data that my calibrations are based off of are um, from field trials we grew here. It just uh, originally it was supposed to be two locations. One of my locations got destroyed in 2017, so it's just based off of one location in this example, but, um, and we do measure those things, but then when I, at the end, when I'm doing my validation and I'll be extrapolate, extrapolating and simulating the genomes to fields data set, they do collect all of that stuff and we will have soil data and, yeah. Mm -hmm.